training in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, and I am here to talk to you guys today about Area Work Platform Emergency Rescue. Uh, this is a topic that has come up uh, within my training over the past 10 years, almost every class, if not uh, once a week. Uh, and it's probably one of the hardest problems to, to deal with. Um, especially now with the high utilization of fall protection and people focusing on fall protection and and rescue and, and then the rescue kind of is a secondary thought. So um, I would like to start with a simple question. What do you do when somebody's stuck in a boomer scissor lift? Um, I remember myself uh, about a year ago, but this time last year, uh, we got a phone call from a customer uh, in a minus 30 degree day telling us that he was stuck and could somebody please come rescue him. Uh, he was working on the outside of a building and fixing a video camera and the machine stalled in the cold and I ended up driving a half an hour and finding a small frozen man in a man basket who really did not look very happy to be there. Um, the emergency battery on the unit had also frozen so we ended up having to use the battery out of my car to provide the, emer the power to the emergency descent. And uh, when I asked the guy, hey, you didn't think it was a little weird to be working by yourself in the cold? And he said, well, the boss said go fix the camera so here I was. Um, and, and the other side of the deal is the cost of having a second person there. So the topics that we're going to really focus on today are ground controls, uh, secondary lift, rope access equipment, high angle rescue team, and systems similar to the Got You system. Um, I've had firsthand ability to use the Got You system and uh, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, but again, you need to have an above access point or somewhere somebody can stand above. So I think the best thing to do is uh, look at some stories first of people getting stuck in the lift. Uh, this is an interesting story that came up um, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, these two workers were stuck in a JLG 1250SJ and the tallest fire truck in the city uh, was 120 and you can actually see the fire truck can't make the man basket. So they had to bring in a secondary crane to rescue the individuals from the man basket. Very common. Um, not common in the sense that it happens every day, but the exposure to this issue is incredibly common. Um, when we're getting up in the ultra booms, um, often you're the tallest piece of equipment in town, let alone uh, on site. And it's very easy for us to say, oh yeah, just grab a crane and rescue the guy. Um, not quite so easy to actually do it. And uh, systems like um, rope access and high angle rescue teams need to have the ability to access the workers from above. And in this situation especially, you can see that I don't think they're standing on the church steeple. All right, uh, next one. This was an interesting one. Uh, these individuals were in a boom lift uh, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, when, uh, when the unit actually tipped into a hole in the ground and uh, got stuck against the side of the building, as you can see. Uh, it took firemen uh, an extended period of time to get the individuals out of the lift. And as you can tell, uh, it takes two guys uh, just trying to get up there to get the individual out. And many of my customers believe uh, when they come to class that the fire department will be their rescue, uh, rescue team and uh, it's often overlooked. Um, in fall pro class uh, we talk about rescue plans which I'll get into here in a minute and you can, you can kind of start seeing where the complexity comes up and, and I understand why it's a very popular question. Um, the last, one I, last uh, real life one I wanted to talk about was uh, the film crew shooting Spider-Man 4 in New York City. Uh, three individuals were stuck in a man basket for two hours waiting for a fire department to rescue them. Um, you can see in the, uh, in the small close-up photo that the individuals are leaving the man basket without proper fall protection. Um, you can also see that they had some additional wood panels up there um, probably to block wind, but again, I, I didn't get uh, first-hand um, conversation with the individuals, but uh, there's more than one thing wrong in this picture. And you can see the uh, cluster and confusion it caused in downtown New York. Um, and having been to New York, those streets are busy at 7 o'clock in the morning and or 5 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the morning. I can only imagine what it would have been like to close down a city street to rescue some guys in a boom lift. And I think it's kind of funny because you'd expect uh, people like the filming industry uh, with with money and, and extra staff. Not one person on site understood how to use the emergency descent system. Uh, it's kind of sad. 
Uh, the last one I wanted to talk about were these guys stuck in a swing stage. I know it's not an aerial, but it's, uh, it's still a rescue scenario. Uh, and you can see a high angle rescue team rescuing from the roof. Uh, again, if we have an, uh, an above uh, location where the workers or rescuers can get to, the rescue is not as complex as people standing on a freestanding area or platform. Um, quick review of the law, uh, 29 CFR 1926-502-D states that an employer shall provide for prompt rescue of the employees in the event of a fall or shall assure that the employees are able to rescue themselves. Now one thing, um, being Canadian, uh, I have read through the uh, CFR, the American document, a few times. Uh, it does closely match our Canadian, but the average worker very rarely has access to a CFR, and if they do, um, this is a very, very small section of the law. Uh, it took me, uh, even having the proper code, uh, almost 25 minutes to, to find the exact section of the code online. Um, personally, I think this should be available to every single worker via mobile devices. Um, maybe we develop an app where uh, they can quickly refer to the CFR law, um, but that's, that's future talk. Um, next conversation is Alberta law. Um, this is one that I work in every day, and uh, it's it's actually very similar in the as to the American. Um, we state that a worker must be rescued. Uh, a worker is expected to rescue workers who have fallen or suspended by fall protection systems. Must be trained in the rescue procedures, um, and these uh, procedures have to be practiced at regular intervals. Um, I watched a very interesting uh, episode of Nerve Center, which I tried to steal a video from, but was unsuccessful. Um, Nerve Center Cirque du Soleil, uh, and I don't know if any of the uh, of the viewers here have seen that, but it was a very interesting uh, look at Cirque du Soleil and the fact that they practice high angle rescues to various performers multiple times through a week and through a show, and. Uh, it really gives you an appreciation for the people that do it every day. Uh, I know myself, I took high angle rescue training in 2005, and uh, it was one of the most physically demanding uh, training courses I've ever taken. And I mean, it's very easy for a boss to say, oh yeah, Johnny, just rescue Stevie if he falls out of the lift. But without the right equipment and the right training, um, and without the pr regular uh, practice of it, uh, you know, it, it's, it's again, not very feasible. Um, I just wanted to take five seconds to focus on the fall protection systems required in the units. Um, being area work platforms, uh, we break them down into two groups. Um, here in Alberta, we tend to refer to them as non-linear and non-linear lifting equipment or boom supported and scissor supported lifting devices. Um, boom supported area work platforms, um, the focus for the fall pro is fall arrest systems. And in order for these fall arrest systems to be efficient, um, keeping them as short as possible um, assists in preventing workers from leaving the platform, thus creating an easier rescue scenario. Um, scissor lifts, uh, here in Alberta, we focus on travel restraint, um, a non-shock absorbing lanyard uh, at a length that reduces the likelihood of a worker being um, or falling out of the platform, thus, again, making the uh, rescue simpler. However, um, both of these systems are very rarely used uh, short or properly adjusted, and uh, workers tend to leave the man baskets, and we then have to provide secondary rescue techniques, um, such as uh, ground controls, uh, secondary lift, uh, high angle rescue team, rope access equipment. Okay, um, I decided that I would quickly insert a example of the Alberta Occupational Health and Safety Rescue Plan. This is the one that I work in quite regularly. Um, and it is required by law for every worker uh, prior to the use of a fall protection system um, to evaluate and identify the hazards, the systems, the procedures, and how exactly they were going to perform rescue. Um, and depending on the fall protection systems used and the hazards being identified, the rescue procedures are often easier said than done. Um, we will quickly review uh, suspension trauma as well. Um, suspension trauma is really the push for uh, fall protection rescue planning. Uh, it's a pretty well-known fact that an individual uh, suspended in a harness can suffer from a pooling of blood effect in the lower extremities, causing uh, workers to lose consciousness and then eventually pass out. Um, very similar to uh, a cadet 
it uh, at parade or um, it or old people uh, in the pooling of blood causing bed sores. Um, this is a it's starting to become a, 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 a considerably well known um, situation. Uh, however. Uh, simple safety straps and uh, lower leg stirrups um, are readily available on most uh, or by most fall protection manufacturers. Uh, DBI Sala has some Miller um, where they're pre-built into the harnesses and then the workers just grip them and, and stand in them. Um, but having actually done that um, and testing the systems out, uh, your legs get quite fatigued very quickly. and. Uh, Although it does lengthen the period of time for the onset of suspension trauma, uh, unless you do, unless you're physically able to do multiple squats, um, it is a very very difficult thing to do for a long period of time, and uh, it's quite amazing how fatigued your leg muscles can get uh, in a short period of time trying to suspend your entire body um, using your own your own leg muscles only. Um, so. Uh, one viable way of rescuing an individual is having them familiarized to the ground control station. Um, a secondary worker knows how to use the ground controls, walks up to the unit, and then safely brings the worker down. Um, however, uh, no two lower control panels are ever the same. And we're going to take a, a little bit of time here to review some of the different uh, lower control systems and emergency descent systems on units. Um, in the picture here, they're JLG boom lift. And if you look very closely, um, you can see no decal um, communicating the emergency descent system or function. Um, often these pieces of equipment are, uh, are used by foreign workers as well. Um, here in Canada, uh, we have a bilingual country. However, the stickers and dec decals that uh, arrive on machines um, are typically in English only. And uh, we have foreign workers from all over the world, similar to the United States. Um, are we doing enough? Uh, we say read the operator's manual. However, if the operator's manual is in English and the worker is um, a fluent Spanish speaker, um, how exactly can we familiarize these workers? Um, often, we're, often employers um, are reluctant to hire a worker simply to stand on the ground and watch somebody work at height. Um, and you can see by this JLG, we have limited operating envelopes as well, um, which also add to the complexity of the system. Um, at first, I would like to quickly review the two uh, Genie boom lifts. Um, the older style boom lifts were a toggle switch system um, in which a wa operator would, uh, or ground control person, um, could command the normal ground controls or put it into emergency descent uh, by holding the auxiliary power switch and then bringing the unit down under secondary controls. Um, the newer generation machines with the push panels, um, although they look very stylish, um, are slightly confusing to everyday workers. Um, I use a Z8060 as a training tool um, twice a week and many, many operators uh, when they first get in contact with that lower control panel are quite overwhelmed. Uh, first of all, this, the deckling uh, is, is, is great to somebody who deals with lifts every day, but to people that don't deal with lifts every day, um, it is kind of confusing and also in the cold it does freeze. Um, I, I strongly suggest uh, to every uh, student that they, uh, they make sure to take time to orientate somebody on the ground controls uh, and make them actually do it in front of them before they go up at height. Uh, but then we get into this situation where the 8060 has uh, a lockout, um, which many people are aware of. If the jib, if, if the unit is put at uh, full elevation and then jib down, they tend to lock out. And uh, the only way to get those individuals out is to do the um, service bypass or the override. Um, with the secondary key. And uh, I think everybody would agree that uh, that's something that we, we don't want untrained individuals doing. Um, and often it's a very special procedure and the instructions to do said procedure are located in the man basket uh, easily 80 feet above the rescuer. Um, looking at the older style um, Genie uh, in D I I DC units, the electrical machines, uh, it's pretty commonplace for the uh, electrical machines to have a manual descent. Uh, however, uh, this particular uh, J, uh, Genie unit, um, this was a Z3020N, um, uses an auxiliary power switch. Um, and it's quite rare and uh, does make training a little bit more difficult when you tell individuals there will always be a hand pump on DC machines, hand pump or pull switch, except for the Genie Z3020N between 2000 and 2007 because they use an auxiliary power system. 
you can understand why that gets confusing. Um, this is actually one machine, and I don't mean to pick on Genie. Uh, I pick on everybody. Um, there was a sad fatality that happened um, with an individual who got his head pinched uh, on the uh, between the upper control panel of the Genie and uh, the top of an elevator. Um, and on this particular vintage of Genie units, uh, the emergency descent cable and ground controls are located on the same side of the unit. Um, this be creates a large problem uh, considering that that was the side that was stuck against the elevator's wall. Um, they waited uh, to get the fire department with the jaws of life and needless to say the individual um, he died uh, being squished at about seven inches of elevation. So um, it's one of those real sad stories. Many manufacturers um, kind of put the emergency descent system in, or at least appears to be, that they kind of put it in as an afterthought, not as a primary focus of the machine's design. And uh, putting the emergency descent and ground controls on the same side, um, I know they've corrected it now, but it was a very serious oversight, and uh, it's a very, very commonplace machine. Uh, the next unit I'd like to take a quick look at is the uh, Snorkel DC Scissors. Um, another one that was uh, definitely an oversight in the emergency descent location. Um, what they Snorkel, uh, for a number of years, put the emergency descent system immediately below the extension deck. And uh, although it seems like a nice, easy place to put it because it's right at the foot of the lift cylinder, um, it does mean that the person rescuing is in a strike hazard. Um, and again, I know the guy should look above his head and ensure that the, you know, the machine isn't going to bonk him in the head. But uh, again, not necessarily the, the, the best place to put it. Uh, we look at the, the little pull cable on the TM-12 that's also located at the front of the unit where most individuals, when they go to work at height, um, will pull that machine directly into their work site, thus preventing any form of rescue because the rescue knob is being blocked by the wall or the lathe or whatever it is that they're working over. Um, again. Emergency descent systems should be a primary design characteristic of the unit. Um, looking at the uh, snorkel boom lifts, uh, now these guys here, again, um, anytime an operator has to use two hands to operate the main control and then a secondary hand to operate the um, actual boom function, uh, although it seems very obvious to a lift uh, guy every day, um, typical end users, um, Again, unless they practice it regularly, um, they may not be uh, affluent on the utilization of this system. And uh, this system really only works uh, if people understand exactly how it works and how to do it quickly. Um, I, I know myself, uh, we've brought the, uh, the, the Snorkel 120 down, um, and it took about uh, 14 minutes to bring it down under emergency. And if we have an individual there, uh, let's say he's diabetic and he's in a harness, uh, he could be severely unconscious uh, by the time we get them down and requiring extensive medical uh, yeah, loss of treatment. Levels. Sorry, guys. Okay, next one, uh, the JLG boom lift. Um, now, this is, uh, again, the, the internal combustion uh, JLGs, JLGs, uh, lower control panels, are incredibly easy to read um, for everyday operators. However, um, most people don't think that the down on the start button will actually be the emergency power. And then if you just hold that, nothing happens. You actually have to hold that and then command a function to make sure you've done it correctly. And most workers that I train, um, once they hit the switch and it doesn't make a noise, they think they're doing it wrong. Um, again, not really a big issue, but I would really think that standardizing these systems, uh, at least in the descriptions, um, would be a, a really strong um, step forward for the industry in, in itself. Uh, it's like having to have an airbag that you turn on before you get in the accident. Um, yeah, it's just difficult. Um, I looked at the Hulot units, um, and Hulot does it, again, um, similar to everybody else. Uh, they use a rear pull cable um, with a secondary valve. And, and again, um, it's just another way of doing it. But anytime you put it at the immediate front or rear, you're committing uh, that worker uh, to, A, understand where it is and ensure that that is always exposed to the back. And again, reading it in the manual uh, may seem logical. However, the average worker, the average drywaller, and the average painter never, ever take the time to read the manuals. Um, we preach it. We tell them they have to. But especially in my younger generation, we don't really tend to look at books or information anyway. So maybe, maybe to some degree, um, we're expecting them to do something that we don't do ourselves. Um, I know some people read uh, the book before they put together the IKEA stuff. 
but most people who put together IKEA stuff put it together and then when they have two bolts left at the end they go back and look at the book to figure out where those bolts go and uh, although uh, it, it is it, most of these systems are very easy to use um, typically the way to do it is stuffed in a book on the top of the band on the top of the man lift or scissor lift and individuals only read those books when there's a problem okay so I'm going to quickly look at the Hulot group again um, their lower control uh, on their internal combustion engine boom lifts, very easy to use. Um, and, and really, I mean, you can train a five-year-old on how to use it. However, the emergency descent is one of those things that we like to see. As you can see, um, does the battery up top tell everybody in the world that's emergency? Well, <laughs> if one guy's using a battery, the other guy's using a lightning bolt, another guy's using a battery with a lightning bolt, uh, there's some consistency, but but again, I think, I think as an industry, um, we can do better. Uh, next little thing I want to look at is the mech system. Um, this is on a lot of the mech scissor lifts where you actually have to physically go up and open a small valve on the uh, lift cylinder. And then we have to open a manual activator on the, on the ground controls. This system is one of these ones that was absolutely 100% an oversight. Um, having individuals putting their hands inside or around scissor stacks um, when there's no safety prop rod in place um, is, is just, I mean, come on, guys. We, we can do better. Um, I know other mechs have different systems. I'm just, I, I wanted to pick out some of the difficult systems uh, that my customers deal with every day um, as conversation points. And I'm not trying to call individual in, uh, manufacturers out. Um, I think as an industry, um, we, we, could, we could possibly do a little better. Now for Skyjack, sorry, Brad, but uh, I have to call out the, uh, the, the, the stick system. Uh, I think everybody that's been around the Skyjack uh, has, has seen the little stick on the side of the scissor lift that you have to stick up and open the little um, knob at the back of the emergency, uh, back of the lift cylinder. Although the system is actually really probably the easiest one for, for a regular everyday user to use, the little stick goes missing all the time. Uh, I know in our rental fleet we run uh, about 30 Skyjack scissor lifts and uh, we are regularly replacing um, the little emergency descent sticks. Guys uh, see a tiny little orange stick and, and they think it can it can help out with their jack at home or, or, or various other things. So um, enough to I don't want to dwell too much on emergency descent systems, but you can already see that there is very little consistency in the design, um, in the deckling, uh, in the communication, and just generally in the look and feel of the systems. Um, I understand that a boom lift and a scissor lift can't have the same system due to multiple lift cylinders versus one lift cylinder. Uh, however, um, the poor average everyday worker who took a one day scissor lift or boom lift class, yes, we say make sure you know the machine, but again, uh, it's much easier for us to say than do. Um, okay, now we're going to look at the idea of a secondary lift. Um, myself, I've actually provided rescue to an individual using a secondary lift in the past. Um, it, it's not ideal. Um, Although it, it's sometimes the easiest one, um, we have to really make sure that we do not put um, the rescuer um, in a unsafe situation. And quite often, um, if it's a tip over situation, uh, putting another lift in the same spot that the first one tipped over is really not going to help nobody. Uh, and relying on a fire department um, is not always feasible. Uh, if you're out of town, uh, I know for us, our volunteer fire department um, in the in a town near us, uh, they 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 say 45 minutes is their average response time uh, to a car accident, let alone a high angle rescue. Um, and I, I gave them a call the other day just to see you know how many individuals on their crew did they even have trained in high angle rescue as a fire department, and they said uh, about three. Okay, and you can see here that uh, that's probably not ideal. The individual should be using 100% tie off from exiting one platform to the other, um, using a, a Y lanyard. However, in cases of emergency with lack of pre planning stuff like this happens. Um, next, uh, so if another area where platform is available on site, um, try to bring the other lift to the site to reach a suspended worker, um, ensure that the uh, rescuer is protected against falling, um, ensure the area where platform has a res uh, capacity which can deal with both you and the victim, and if the victim has been suspended for a long time or has suffered a head injury um, and lost consciousness, um, you're going to have to try to position that machine up underneath the individual, and you're probably going to need two workers. So now, instead of one worker painting the wall, now we need to have three workers, two machines, just in case one guy falls. Okay, you're going to steal the other crew's or other subtrades machine. Fine, but this requires pre-planning, asking them, hey, can I use your lift in case of emergency? It goes back to that original rescue plan. And uh, as a survey, 
Um, about 5% of students uh, in my classes actually have rescue plans properly completed and reviewed before they work at height. Again, um, it's all about dollar dollar bills. Okay, the next one I wanted to quickly look at is a pre-installed self-rescue system. Um, this is from Ferno, uh, an Australian company that builds a bucket truck um, and lift self-rescue system. I know this system's fantastic. Um, I tried to find a video of it being utilized and plunk it in here, but uh, I wasn't so tech savvy. However, um, this is a system that, that uh, an employer would install up on the man basket uh, and, and tip kind of almost anticipating the unit getting stuck. And uh, again, uh, this is cost plus to the unit. Now for a customer who owns his own machine, this is a very feasible system. Um, but for a rental company to outfit all its machines to this um, becomes a logistical nightmare. I'm sure United Rentals and uh, RSC and, and those guys would have an interesting say if, if every single boom lift had to have and scissor lift had to have one of these installed. Um, it just becomes a logistical nightmare. Uh, we have 65 booms in our rental fleet and to outfit that on every unit, um, I mean the cost was not overly high but then you have to train individuals on how to use that system. So then they require secondary training just on how to rescue themselves, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, here's a self-rescue system that comes from Canada. It's called the DCIS system, or the Quick Cord, or Q-Cord system. Um, it's actually kind of neat. Uh, basically, uh, the little thing rips open, you get a couple of leg loops, and, and the worker can you know, climb back up the ladder into the scissor lift or boom lift. However, a uh, properly adjusted system shouldn't let the guy fall out of the unit anyway. And if he is falling out of it, in this scenario, more often than not, um, the individuals had taken a head injury um, and he's unconscious. So this is great if the guy's conscious and physically fit enough to climb a rope ladder. But uh, the <clears throat> drywallers I know, yeah, they're not physically fit enough to do that um, or just about any other trade. Come on, guys. Uh, the trade man with his classic paunch belly. Um, not all of them, but there are. Can you see those guys climbing them and climbing back up a rope? Um, hmm. Yeah, I I personally don't see it happening. Uh, maybe a small percentage can. So then here's the other option, right? We're going to go to this uh, electric um, cable climber. This is a porta lift uh, made in India, and uh, you know what? It's a cute little system absolutely fantastic. It climbs very quickly up and down the side of a building, uh, could easily get up to rescue an individual, but requires secondary training, requires it to be on site, and it's again cost for, some, uh, for a, a possible eventuality that really if the operator was trained correctly shouldn't happen. Yeah, it, it's just it, it's tough to convince the average day, everyday employer that you should buy this expensive little kit just in case a worker does something he's not supposed to and is put in a situation that he's not supposed to be in. I, I know it. the system's beautiful. It works very well. However, there's a, there's a serious cost involved. Um, I tried to look and find out exactly how much this device cost. Uh, the cheapest I found it uh, as a distributor was $1,100 per unit. Uh, and then we're going to get into systems like the gotcha system absolutely fantastic system. Um, the first time I saw this at a, a ARA show, uh, I, was, I was spellbound by it. I thought it was uh, very innovative using a pole and reaching down and clipping the guy, which is great. But you do need to have an access point above the individual, as you guys can see here. I know they have a low angle rescue system and a high angle rescue system. However, this system still is kind of dependent upon having an ability to get above the worker. And if you're on that 125 we looked at earlier, um, not a lot of options to get above the guy. So, you know, I guess on, in a, on a scissor lift in a warehouse where we have access on the roof above, okay, maybe feasible. Um, but uh, that sure doesn't look comfy either. And uh, the average worker doesn't even have the front D-rings. They're running rear D-rings. And I know you can still rescue the guy, but it's all part of the complexity of the system. You require special training on this and regular practicing. Do the regular, what, what job site is going to say, hey, I'm going to, you go and say, hey, I, I'm, we're going to practice a rescue fall on your job site. Um, and if it doesn't work, we're going to call the fire department to rescue. Stop construction. We need to practice the rescue. I, I, I just I don't see it. And it, it doesn't get done. Um, and I'm really interested uh, at the end of this to hear you guys' thoughts on, on that problem. Am I the only one? Uh, do you guys regularly run into, uh, into situations where um, companies are, are closing down 
facilities and job sites to practice rescues. Um, maybe not in facility maintenance, because I understand, you know, in gas plants, that, that's a regular occurrence, but building the Walmart warehouse in, you know, middle of nowhere, Georgia, is a general contractor really, really focusing on, on the sub-trades practicing rescues? No, they're trying to get the building built as quick as possible. Um, so I did some research into high angle rescue training. I took my high angle rescue training with Mountain Industrial Safety uh, in a number of years ago. I think what were seven years or something like that ago, and uh, it was it was terribly interesting and and and, and not easy to do. Um, I quickly online and tried to find uh, some realistic uh, everyday high angle rescue train course training training and train the trainer courses. Um, the Advanced Rescue Techniques and School of Canada has it for eleven hundred dollars, um, which. Uh, doesn't seem like that much, but when you start getting into the equipment cost, it, it really does become something. And then I found uh, the Roco guys, um, and they're willing to do it for um, a, a smoking good deal of 1095 for early registration, or 1195 uh, if it's a late registration. As you can see, they kind of do it all over the, the country and uh, regular dates. Now these training courses tend to take three to four days, and you know you're really going to need a crew of. Uh, at least three to four individuals to provide high angle rescue. So the uh, window washers uh, who run an operating budget or a profit margin of, of 15 to 20 percent, uh, taking four workers away uh, to send them to a thousand dollar course somewhere to learn high angle rescue on the slight possibility that somebody might fall, uh, the fire department just seems like a much cheese, cheaper and reasonable option. And it's tough to argue. Um, here's some equipment required. Uh, just a quick look at the different pieces of equipment required by a high angle rescue team. And you can see in there that, uh, yeah, I think the gloves and the bags are the cheap bit. Um, you can see that those baskets uh, are very expensive, carabiners. This is all stuff you need to stock. Where are you going to put it on a job site? You're going to put it in the job shack? Hey, at a gas plant, maybe you can dedicate a, a room. At a, uh, at a pulp mill, you can dedicate an office or a, a closet. But um, regular everyday job sites, they're they're not going to dedicate room to their their uh, their job shacks or 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 tool cribs to have a rescue system. Okay, they might, but the likelihood of that is is, is again very slim. Not the customers I'm training, and uh, I, I don't know about you guys. Again, I, I'm interested to hear your feedback. Um, high angle rescue training. Um, here's equipment required for one person, and uh, this is the average kit. So you need to get your helmet, your harness, um, and and the Yates is, is pretty nice. Uh, thank you, Yates, for all of this stuff because it really does give you a kind of general idea of, of all the stuff a guy needs for the potential rescue. And uh, again, cost, overhead. Okay, uh, here's actually a really cool look, uh, U.S. military practicing uh, high angle rescue. And uh, you can see the guy in the basket uh, doing a descent. And um, again, uh, having, having done this uh, a little bit, having been trained in it, uh, it is it is very physically demanding and uh, definitely not for the faint of heart. Um, even if you're okay with heights, it is a different experience walking backwards down a height, uh, down down a wall, uh, you know, on a rope. Uh, even doing rock climbing and such, this is this is a significantly different experience. And um, I mean, the training is is incredibly in depth. Um, here's a look at just some of the equipment required to provide uh, high angle rescue training. Um, and you can see here that, um, first of all, the crews are split into groups of, uh, of, of four, uh, sometimes three or four, and you can see the, the lay down, the kit, the, the people, and the logistical nightmare involved in doing this. Uh, how often would they practice it? Um, are they going to set up this system in their, in their shop, uh, which typically you know, a lot of the small contractors run out of their truck? Um, yeah, they have scaffold, or they're going to set it up at a job site and say, actually, we're going to stop construction for two days so we can practice our high angle rescue. Nice idea. Maybe not as feasible as, as, as we'd like it to be. Um, so that leaves fire department. That leaves self-rescue systems. Um, but none of these things are, are really um, ideal. And uh, the fire departments, uh, you know, as the lifts get taller, the fire department's ladder trucks don't necessarily match. Um, a 125 um, full stick, good luck. And then, and then you're expecting the firemen to understand the ground control stations on the machines when the mass man, when the manual's up in the man basket. Again, adding complexity to an already complex system. Um, just a quick bibliography. Um, 
I got a lot of stuff from uh, Vertical.net and uh, you know Arborist Canada. Again, uh, Safe T Web Conference, and uh, yeah. So, I don't know what I do now. I think I'm done. That's the PowerPoint, at least. Thank you. Okay, great. Let me get back to uh, take these controls back. Okay, we had a couple questions for you, Dallas, come from the audience, Hit. and um, I'll go ahead and get started on those, and then if you wouldn't mind answering them as we get them, some other people might have some questions that come in after that, so um, Excellent. please sit tight, and I will start reading those off. Does Canada, uh, do Canadian-based rescue teams have the correct protocols for treating injured workers for suspension trauma? In the U.S., we've had to educate many rescue squads prior to working on site. Um, well, they say that uh, rescue can only be uh, provided by trained rescue workers. And uh, in the rescue course I took, uh, they did focus on uh, suspension uh, rescue techniques and, and, and the idea of not laying the individual down, putting them in seated position to reduce the, the pooling of blood, all that kind of stuff. Um, however, the average worker doesn't know it. I include it as part of my fall protection training. Uh, I dedicate 10 minutes to dealing with a suspended worker. However, the average training course, honestly, they barely cover it. Okay. Are most fire uh, departments trained in high angle rescue? Um, locally, uh, we have one firehouse uh, that has a high angle rescue crew. They are considered to be the high angle and low angle rescue uh, team and they work at a station 14. We had an accident uh, two years ago where a swing stage let go and two individuals were stuck on the side of our law courts and it took them 43 minutes to rescue the first individual and the fire department was across the street uh, because they had to wait for the proper high angle rescue team guys. Um, having friends and, and talk to other guys on uh, you know fire departments locally. Um, no, uh, the remote or the small town ones that are typically um, uh, volunteer based do not have the high angle or appropriate high angle rescue training. If a company is faced with a rescue situation where the operator or rental company has no clue how to proceed, where does he begin and who does he call first? Well, I would say that uh, Obviously, ground controls are going to be your first and best bet. Um, hopefully, we had an individual on the ground that has working knowledge of how the ground control systems work. Um, I say, you know, you see a guy, he gets stuck. Number one thing, call fire department. Number two thing, get him something like a suspension release strap or a secondary lanyard to put underneath the worker's legs. that will buy him some time for the rescue. I always say, do what you got to do. If you got to throw it to him, drop it to him, or shoot it to him through a potato cannon. The guy needs something to stand on. That's your primary focus. After that, worry about getting the guy down. Okay. Answer requires the occupants be removed before the operation of ground controls. What's your opinion on this standard? Uh, if the individual is in a location where uh, they can be harmed, absolutely get them out of the basket. But uh, again, easier said than done. Um, bringing in a, a secondary machine to try to rescue the guy and putting them in an unsafe location versus using the ground controls retracting the boom back to a safe location. I, I think it's more situational than uh, one law can cover. Uh, here in Alberta we say you know that, that as long as the system is practiced uh, and, and it doesn't put somebody else in a, in a, in a dangerous situation, I think, I think we're doing our due diligence. Okay. I'd be actually interested to hear what everybody else's thoughts is on that one. <laughs> maybe, maybe the person who wrote it in can uh, put their thought down. I think it was Jeff. Yeah. Uh, of course it was Jeff. That's such a tough <laughs> thing to do. Ask me the tough ones, Jeff. Um, this is more of a comment than a question, but when you went back, to, going back to your comment on the snorkel 120 taking 14 minutes to lower with the auxiliary controls. Yeah. Um, 
their comment was, in the event of a needed rescue, you would use the primary lower control. The auxiliary controls are for use in the event of a primary power loss. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, machines run out of fuel all the time. Okay. And, and, and if you're going to use the engine and it's out of fuel, then you've got to fill it up, bleed each injector to bring the unit down. Okay. And they don't provide a primer bulb to do it easily. A true life story, we had a guy stuck in our 120 because he ran out of fuel. Okay. Um, are there any movements in industry associations to standardize the rescue controls on equipment? Uh, any, well, I know myself, I've had conversation with both uh, Jeff and Brad Bueller um, with ANSI and CSA about working on a standardization of de decals and descriptions on area work platforms. Uh, I wrote an article about it uh, with uh, Access Lift and Handlers uh, for Lindsay Anderson in regards to standardizing the control systems, at least the, dis the, the decals and descriptions. Um, maybe we re represent the ground control uh, or emergency descent the same little sticker. Um, have, uh, but that's pretty much where that ended. I know it, it's, it's very idealistic. We all want it, but uh, the industry, the push has to come from somewhere. I don't know if that's I, really I don't know an anything Katie. either. I think we've covered it before too, and and just the idea of standardizing controls, um, it's just an idea at this point. Well, you know, um, the four-way flasher is standard in every vehicle for a reason. In cases of emergency, people don't think they react and they go with what they know. And when you change them all up on different units, we're adding complexity and 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 where we don't want complexity at all. I don't think I've asked this que uh, question yet, but um, it seems reasonable to add operation of the ground controls to the qualification requirements for various lift equipment. Any on advice on how to do that? Any advice on how to train individuals on the consistently changing and uh, ever, yeah, ever confusing ground control stations? I know for myself, um, we do training in two ways. Uh, we do in-class training, um, which is uh, what we basically call ma uh, macro training, where we train on all different types of equipment and basically get uh, workers orientated and, and, and comfortable with the idea of working at height. And then we provide a familiarization trainer who goes specifically to site to ensure that the individual using a machine understands the specific control characteristics about that unit. And uh, then we end up all making sure that the guy can function even from the ground controls. We are super rare in the sense that we send somebody specifically to site for our customers to ensure that they know how the ground controls and main control systems work. Okay. We're kind of losing you on volume a little bit. Oh, okay. Did I move too far away? Yes. That's Is it better. better now? Okay. Uh, another, going back to the snorkel engine fuel question. Oh. Um, <laughs> if an engine, if the engine runs out of fuel, is that considered an emergency? When you have individuals stuck at 120 feet at minus 30, I think it should be. Okay. Now, in its own right, is that an emergency? No, but situationally, um, it could very well be. Okay. Uh, Great. We live in the cold, and how? What, what if? What if the machine runs out of uh, fuel and it's a high wind situation? What if, what if the unit passes its EMS and gets stuck, and then nobody on the ground knows how to use the ground controls? Because the book that tells them how to do it is up at the top. Okay, I think that's it for questions from the audience. Uh, if, if there are no others, uh, we appreciate your time today, Dallas, and we appreciate all your uh, everyone tuning in. The next presentation is next Thursday, same time, same place, 2 p.m., um, so December 8th, Brad Bueller with Skyjack will be speaking on selecting the right a AWP for the project. Um, you do have to sign up again for this unless you shoot me an email and uh, it's on the screen and we can just get you signed up again if you'd like to, to tune in next week. The following week after that on the 15th is Rich Stollery and he's going to be speaking about new strategies for site inspections. We hope to see you all again, and uh, thank you all again for, for spending your afternoon with us. Appreciate it.